Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop. Today, something for everyone. Fellow 200 pound shop gorilla who wishes to remain anonymous uh, was kind enough to snag this out of the waste stream, industrial waste stream, and to send it on to me. I'm not 100% sure what it is. I have, a, I have an inkling, but uh, we're going to do a bolter teardown on industrial oddware. Looks to be some sort of automation equipment. Check it out. Spare no expense. Got the Belden cable there. And also, released the schmoo. You know it's going to be good when it's got pixies and schmoo. Now this is all CNC machine billet aluminum aerospace grade. No, well, maybe not, but there we go. It flew. Now it's aerospace grade. 6160, of course. All CNC machined. Lovely machining on it. Spared no expense. This obviously is not a consumer good. Uh, I mean, just look at the cork stuffer. It's pricey. Got the Belden cable here all wound up like a pigtail, but as you can see, it's got some sort of urethane or uh, expensive coating on there. Nine conductor, all shielded. Each cable is marked in white ink. So this is where the uh, UV LED comes in, the pocket torch there for, for looking at that. And this is a little bit scary here. This is a huge watch spring. It's the biggest watch spring I've ever seen. So this must be some sort of preloading device. Which way? No, it must go that way. Yeah. Oh yeah. So there's the mechanical side and this was full of oil. I guess for lubricating the watch spring. Now these freak me out that comes apart and no safety squint is going to save you so I'm going to go ahead and uh, take precautions. Two condoms, mother on speed dial and safety McGlarses if I can find them. Really not all that much to this side other than that big nasty spring bearing in here in a shaft which must turn the sensor in here yeah whatever sensor that is uh, it has been well used the particulate matter in there it's all old wear from the from the spring the guy that sent me this had a mind to integrate it into the hydraulic bartending robot he said it is an angle sensor so it must be some sort of encoder oh okay there we go look at that we just have to index to these fasteners presumably I don't see how that'll come apart but maybe when you see an additional machining process on a part that there's no need for, you know it's got to be for something. Like there's no need to drill these holes in here. This would just be cast or, or yeah, that would just be cast. Well, anyway, good guess. And there's something in there. So let's see what that does. We'll take these fasteners out. Hopefully I didn't wreck anything. But a lot of times if it's industrial gear, it's pretty hard to destroy. Consumer goods, you know, you look at it sideways and it breaks into a million pieces, but industrial stuff tends to be quite a bit more skookum. Oh yeah, it's coming. Woo! Oh, it just popped out of there. Kind of surprised me a little bit. This, <laughs> what it, like, look at the amount of machining. The shaft through there, all the bearings in there just to actuate this little Tamagawa Seiki Co. FA solver. I wonder if this is a resolver and not an encoder. Well we could figure it out the hard way what with Chooch and Pixies in here and seeing what comes out or we could figure it out the easy way. Which way you figure I'm gonna go for. Sure enough this thing is cool as fuck. It's a rotary resolver as opposed to an encoder. I'm sure you've heard of encoders for, well, essentially all it is, it's slots in a, in a rotor and it either counts the pulses or, or chooches light through and, and resolves that way. That can tell you how many steps that it's done, but it can't actually tell you the absolute position. So a resolver, it always knows, say you shut it down, and you lose the memory, you always know where it's at. If it's at 
zero degrees or 90 or 360 or whatever. It always knows. Whereas a, an encoder, it doesn't know. It's just counting the pulses. So if you boot it up and, and you turn it around a few times, it'll count those pulses. But it doesn't know if the motor shaft is at zero degrees or at 360 degrees. So this could come in very, very handy. I'm going to show you how it works. Now I can offer the Fergan life of me find a pinout, so we're going to have to map the pinout. It's okay, there's only six wires and I have an inkling of what's going on. So essentially what we're doing is we have our multimeter in ohm scale. And we're just going to check from one wire to, to all the rest of them. So that's in mega ohms, there's nothing there, it's supposed to be disconnected. That's open circuit there. Let's try the red with the, there we go. Okay, so these two have got to be together. And we'll try the red and the black. I might be power in, right? If you look at this, oh yeah, red and the black. Got to be power in. Because to all the rest of them, it's mega ohms. And in here it was 200 and something ohms. Okay, I'm, I'm going to show you what's going on. And what this little Guga actually is, is a rotary transformer. As you can see by my hardware edition. Of... AveCAD, the licensing fees are a killer. And a transformer is essentially a torque converter for electrical pixies. So you know how the demo they do is one fan in front of the other, you turn the one fan on and it makes the other fan turn. Okay, that's the same thing, but the air instead is magnetism. It's magnets. So what we do is if we have DC, say we put a battery across here, and we coil up a wire and we let the uh, pixies flow that creates a magnetic field now we put a we put a nail through there a carpenter's nail through there what do we get we get to pick stuff up with that magnetism and it's an electromagnet now what happens if we take the nail and we make it a ring all the way around well the problem is Magnetism only induces voltage in a conductor when the magnetic flux is changing. So it has to be changing. You can't just turn it on and leave it on. You're not going to have any, you'll have power through this side. You won't have any power through this side. Transformers only work for AC. So how the hell does this thing work? Because it's not getting 120 volts AC. So what we do is we take DC and we chop it up into pulses. Say a thousand times a second we chop it up. Now the magnetic field that's in here is constantly expanding and contracting and that creates uh, a magnetic flux in the in the circular toroidal nail and that creates uh, a current flow well a difference in potential a voltage in this line and then if you connect them you get current actually flowing. So the transformer in layman's terms very simply put takes electrical energy turns it into magnetic energy and then turns it back into electric energy. Now the interesting thing about that of course is if you have different numbers of turns, you have a different ratio, you get like a gear reduction in a transmission. So you can get more voltage or less voltage depending on what you do. This is not what this does. What this does is even fucking smarter. It has a winding at 90 degrees to this one and this whole assembly here it's spinema things and because it's spinema thing and it cuts the magnetic field in a different vector victor so what happens is we get different varying voltages out of here and here depending on what angle this is so we take a microcontroller like an arduino and we output to the primary side ones and zeros just offs and ons a thousand times a second at five volts this guy which is at perpendicular to it is going to show five volts across here this guy is going to show zero volts now as this turns these two voltages vary and if we read this just with a very simple voltmeter we can determine exactly exactly the position that this is at. Now if we feed this back into a controller, say an Arduino, 
An Arduino is a digital device, it's not an analog device. So it needs a converter to read that voltage. It's called a DAC, a digital to analog converter. And depending on the microcontroller, it has different bit sizes. Okay, so remember the old no friendo was 8-bit. That meant you had 256 colors, possible colors on the screen at once. Okay, the digital to analog converter in the Arduino is 10-bit. That means 2 to the power of 10. So that means that there's 10 little memory slots there to use for the values of these. 2 to the power of 10 is 1024. Okay, so that means that the digital to analog converter has 1024 different positions that it can resolve using this. However, it's more than that. It's got to be twice that because there's two outputs and that means 2050 <laughs> different positions. So if you take 360 degrees Divide that by 2048, that's going to be 0 0.17, 0 0.17 we'll say, 0.17 of a degree resolution. Super, super accurate we can get, and it's all because the primary is wound and the two secondaries are wound 90 degrees to each other and they're rotary. We read the output off of here and we know exactly where this is positioned. Say we have a device, say a robot, a eh? hydraulic bartending robot, that we want the arm to be at 360. We can, we can put it to 360, we can turn it off, we can pull the computer out, put it back together, and it will go back to 360. We don't need another external switch to tell it the, it's home or whatever. It, it knows. And actually thinking about this now, this will go into negative voltage. So if you had five volts here and this turned 180, you would have zero volts still on this one because it's at 90 degrees perpendicular. But this one would actually be negative five volts. So for instance, if we were to put this on the, the milling machine table, what kind of resolution could, what kind of what kind of precision could we expect? And not the same thing, accuracy and but so figure 48 inch travel um, divide that's 0 0.17 angulations. No, no, no. 48. It'll be 48 inches divided by 2050, which will be like 20 over 20 thou. Yeah, that's no good. So that's not going to work for a Bridgeport milling machine, but for a bartending robot. We are very fortunate here to have a device that 20 years ago some engineer would have given his left nut for. Incredible device. The Asmeloscope, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, now you can see same signal in both sides and same timing exactly, but slightly different amplitude. The amplitude would be the voltage, of course. Now if we change this, you can see one's growing. Huh? Pretty cool. So if you just have a dumb multimeter, you'll be able to check the voltage here. Well, actually, we can check the voltage on this. It's in software, but it should be okay. There we go. So if we look at the RMS, it's 200 millivolts. Let's change that. Now it's dropping, 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 dropping. Zero, essentially. So that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the angle of that transformer winding vary according to the rotation. Okay, so we're focused in on the on the voltage, the root mean square. I, <laughs> I'm receiving messages from the mothership apparently. But as, as we rotate this, maybe if I don't touch the metallic part, I just touch, touch the, yeah. As we rotate the wheel, look at that. You can see the voltage completely change. And all we're doing is we're just changing the angulation of the secondary windings versus the primary windings. 
So at zero volts, we know that the blue coil is actually at 90 degrees to the primary. There we go, a technology old as the hills, still in use, skookum as frig. There's a lot of overlap there with an encoder, but this has the advantage of absolute positioning. You know exactly where this is because you're not counting the pulses, you're just checking the voltage between the two. And you can also see which direction it's turning depending on negative positive voltage, all that kind of thing. But you know exactly where this thing is. Those sound to me like very good features to have in a hydraulic bartending robot. Thanks a lot for watching. Keep your dick in a vice.